אפילו גם ככה, זה לא מדינה יהודית. מה הכוונה שלי? יש פה הרבה נוצרים, יש לך פה 70 ארצות, לא כולם פה יהודים. מה יכול להיות? Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on over 30 cable stations from Maine to New York City on the internet at thestruggle.org. Today, Palestine, Korea, New York City taxi drivers, and Cornell West. On February 4th, at about 5 a.m., civil administration officials and security forces arrived at a small community, Abu Anwar, and demolished two buildings of the community school. The classrooms had been used by 25 kids in grades three and four. They had just been constructed in September of last year. Money from the European Authority, uh, rather the European Union and the Palestinian Authority. September 2017. A month later, the Israeli civil administration and security officials come into the community and confiscate the doors of these classrooms and put up a, dem a demolition order. And then, as you see, they knock everything down. The cartoonist Latouf drew this cartoon showing how the European Union builds and Israel destroys. Israeli plans to expel 37,000 African refugees is finally getting some international media attention. Of special interest is an op-ed in the New York Times by an Israeli rabbi totally opposed to the expulsions. More on the subject from the group with the Twitter handle, Refugees for Sale. The principle of non-refoulement prohibits any removal of a person to a country where his or her life or freedom may be threatened. This prohibition of removal is commonly regarded as the cornerstone of international refugee law. הייתה מוצאת, מוצאת לעצמה דרך אחרת, הרבה פחות רגישה ואולי הרבה פחות מכילה כמו מדינת ישראל בלהעביר אותם חזרה למדינות מוצאם או למדינות אחרות. אני רוצה להגיד כאן על הדוכן הזה, אני נציגת משרד החוץ הישראלי, אנחנו מעורבים לעומק באותם הסכמים שמעבירים את אותם מסתנני עבודה. אותם מהגרי עבודה לא חוקיים שהגיעו למדינת ישראל, שאני לא מוכנה בשום צורה שנכנה אותם פליטים, כי זה פשוט לא הולך ב, ב, באמת באופן אמיתי עם העובדות. אני מתחייבת לך על הדוכן הזה, לא נשקפת סכנה לחייהם. And on Israel Social TV in Hebrew with English subtitles. The 
חושבים תושבים ותיקים מדרום תל אביב על גירוש מבקשי המקלט? הממשלה והתקשורת מציגות תמונה מוחלטת. כולם בעד. בואו נבדוק אם היא משקפת את המציאות בשטח. מה אתה חושב? אני בן לבן. מצד אחד אני רוצה לזרוק אותם כי הם די דופקים לנו פה את החיים, אבל מצד שני תשלח אותם לאן? ל- להירצח וללמות? לדעתי אני לא מפריעים לי. אני שלושים שנה פה, כולם אוהבים אותי, כל הפועלים זרים. אני אוהבת אותם, אני לא מזיקה להם, הם לא מזיקים לי. בפרס היינו מעורבבים, אני אפילו בבית ספר במוסלמי הייתי, אבל... אני חי פה כבר שלושים, ארבעים שנה בדרום תל אביב. יושבים לי פה, אני משוחח איתם, אנשים אינטליגנטים, וסבבה, אין כולם אלה מסתננים, מחפשים עבודה, כולם צעירים, אף אחד לא רודף אותם, אף אחד לא מחפש אותם. אתה אוהב לגרש אותם למדינות ששם יהיה להם יותר גרוע, עדיף להשאיר אותם פה במצב שלהם פה ולא לגרש אותם, כי יש המון שכבר נרצחו. הרבה אנשים רואים, אומרים, זה תושבי דרום תל אביב, הם רק רוצים לגרש, והם זה... כן, אבל זה סטיגמה, זה סטיגמה. לא יודעת, העמדה שלי היא שמישהו מסתנן, שיגרשו, ומישהו פליט, שישאירו. אנחנו מדינה שאנחנו ניצולי שואה, ואנחנו נותנים, איך אומרים, תמיכה. אבל תן תמיכה לפליט, אל תיתן תמיכה לסוחר סמים. אתה אומר, צריך לבדוק מי פליט ומי לא. אבל, אבל, כן, אבל לא עושים את זה, חבר'ה. אם היו עושים את זה, כבר נגמר. זה כבר נגמר. המדינה לא אכפת לה. לא אכפת לה מי מאף אחד? בדרום לא אכפת לה. זה לא כמו שהיה פעם, אנחנו גדלנו, הייתה שכונה כיפית, שיחקנו, ולא היה מפחיד לצאת החוצה. לא רוצים התבוללות, זו מדינה שלנו, אנחנו לא רוצים אותם פה, לא טוב לנו איתם פה. הם אנשים סימפטיים, הם לא מדליקים. אנשים אומרים, צריכה להיות מדינה יהודית, שלא יהיו פה אנשים שהם לא יהודים. <laughs> אתם מצאים אותי. אפילו לא גם ככה, זה לא מדינה יהודית. ומה הכוונה שלי? יש פה הרבה נוצרים, יש לך פה 70 ארצות, לא כולם פה יהודים. מה יכול להיות? תקציב של הגירוש, זה הולך להיות מיליונים. אז קח את המיליונים האלה, במקום לגרש אותם, תדאג להם. צריך לטפל בהם, לשקם אותם, לתת להם תעסוקה מסודרת. יש חלק מהם שמסתדרים, שעובדים. אתה רואה שהם חיים בצורה אחרת, הם לא עושים בעיות. אמנם גם אני שחור, לא בעיר, אבל בגלל הצבע שלהם, אז הם לא אוהבים אותם פה, אתה מבין? היה בית פתוח אצלי, אף פעם לא נכנסו, לא גנבו, לא כלום, דברים שלי בחוץ, תסתכל. והם אומרים, אתה גר פה בשכונה עם השחורים? אומר, כן. למרות שחשדתי שיהיה פער בין מה ששומעים בתקשורת למה שקורה בשטח, אני באמת הופתעתי מהעומק שלו. לממשלה המצב הזה בטוח נוח. היא משחקת על סטריאוטיפ גזעני של התושבים המזרחים כמתלהמים ושונאי זרים, שכל הבעיות שלהם ייפתרו עם גירוש הפליטים. כך היא מתחמקת מלתת מענה אמיתי לבעיות האחרות בדרום תל אביב, שהיא אחראית להן. אז נכון, אין ספק שהמציאות כאן מתוחה ומסוכסכת, אבל בפעם הבאה שמספרים לכם שכל תושבי דרום תל אביב הם בעד הגירוש, כדאי לקחת את זה בעירבון מוגבל. points. Netanyahu always refers to these asylum seekers as infiltrators, as if they were spies or saboteurs. There's a history to that word. Back in 1948, when tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were forced from their home because of the war, some tried to go back to their home after the armistice. These were termed infiltrators, and they were shot. A second point, how racist Israel is on all this. There are more than 37,000 white non-African, non-Jews in Israel. But these are not harassed. They're from the old Soviet Union. They're not bothered in any way. I wrote an article about all this for the Hearst Papers in Connecticut. We link to it at our site, thestruggle.org. <music> professor Alexis Dudden is a professor of history at University of Connecticut and a specialist in Korean and Japanese history. She is speaking at a Tijin for promoting enduring peace. 
I interviewed her by phone on February 9th. Last year, I saw a series of threats and grim counter threats from President Trump and Supreme Leader Kim over Korea. But this year, there's been something surprising, an agreement between the two Koreas over the Olympics. Can you describe it? It's actually quite a long-built uh, fruition of positive diplomatic efforts uh, of engagement and attempt at engagement. Uh, we know that the South Korean administration of Moon Jae-in has been actively seeking North Korean participation. It was one of the first things President Moon said upon coming into office last spring that he would welcome North Korean participation, including and invited them actually really noticeably to travel by land, uh, emphasizing the proximity uh, and interrelation of the, of the two Koreas. Um, and so then the, there was this uh, really counterproductive tweet storm and uh, bellicosity between both Washington and Pyongyang in a way that, you know, for, for North Korea has often uh, had provocative rhetoric as a standard feature of its governance, international relations governance. Um, but for the first time, the United States has chosen to play by Pyongyang's rule book. And in doing that, really sort of threw a lot of the standard fare of diplomatic norms out the window. Um, now, some may say that North Korea always throws things out the window. That may well be, but this is the first time that we've had a U.S. leader so willing to uh, play by those norms. So we had this really destabilizing series of months in which, uh, unfortunately, uh, serious war plans have been uh, really ratcheted up on the U.S.'s part, and in the mix, South Korea's President Moon Jae-in has made abundantly clear that regardless of what uh, certain voices in Washington say about all options are on the table, war is not an option for South Korea or North Korea because any military action would lead to the utter annihilation of both Koreas. So as the leader of South Korea, uh, he's not an appeaser. He's not uh, a pacifist by any means. I mean, the man was in special forces himself. That said, he is saying we simply cannot have a war because my nation, my South Korea, would be obliterated. See the full interview on our channel on YouTube. Now a shocking story, a taxi driver barely holding on economically an activist, a protester, his final protest. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We begin today's show here in New York. On Tuesday, taxi drivers held a vigil to remember a livery car driver who'd committed suicide outside the gates of City Hall Monday. Douglas Shifter is believed to be the third New York City driver to commit suicide in the past three months. In a message posted on Facebook, Shifter blames city and state leaders and ride-sharing apps like Uber for pushing him and other taxi drivers into financial despair. He wrote, quote, I work 100 to 120 consecutive hours almost every week for the past 14-plus years. When the industry started in 1981, I averaged 40 to 50 hours. I cannot survive any longer with working 120 hours. I am not a slave, and I refuse to be one. Bloomberg, de Blasio and Andrew Cuomo have each had their part in destroying a once-thriving industry. There are over 100,000 of us suffering daily now. It is the new slavery, he wrote. He went on to say, there seems to be a strong bias by the mayor and governor in favor of Uber, a company that is a known liar, cheat and thief, Shifter wrote. Over the past five years, the number of four hire cars has more than doubled in the city, largely thanks to Uber. But the soaring number of cars has resulted in a financial crisis for many longtime taxi drivers who now struggle to get customers. Shifter had warned about this in the pages of the publication Black Car News, where he wrote a monthly column, but his warnings were ignored. 
Neil Weiss, owner of Black Car News, said, quote, his life was really falling apart. He couldn't pay his house or for his car. He was doing his best to pay for what he owed. We're joined right now by Beta Vidasai, who is executive director and co-founder of the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, which represents over 19,000 taxi drivers in New York City. Last April, she testified before the Taxi and Limousine Commission and warned about the rising despair among drivers. Beta Desai, welcome back to Democracy Now! This Thank you. tragedy that has just occurred. Talk about what happened on Monday, who Douglas Shifter was. Well, Douglas Shifter was a longtime, over 30 year professional black car driver in New York City. And he had also been an activist. He's a prolific writer for the industry papers. And he went early morning um, in front of City Hall and he shot himself. And before he had uh, shot himself, he wrote a post on Facebook where, you know, he really just outlined, I think, the reality that over 100,000 drivers, professional drivers in New York City are facing. What is that reality? It's, there, it's a race to the bottom. Every day, people are going deeper and deeper into poverty. And this, this is the reality of the so-called gig economy. It's about destroying what has been a full-time profession, turning it into part-time poverty pay work. Um, Uber and company, Uber and Lyft, and by the way, they are, they're absolutely the same. It's all one same business model. They used their political might. Um, last, in, in 2016, Uber and Lyft combined spent more on lobbying than Amazon and Walmart combined, and, and Microsoft as well. And so they used their political might to win deregulation bills. <clears throat> they used more money on lobbying than mm -hmm. Walmart, Microsoft, and um, Amazon. And Amazon combined. combined. Yes. Um, in a few years ago, um, Uber had 33 percent more lobbyists than just Walmart itself. And, you know, Amy, the most amazing thing here is that the, what they're lobbying for is first exemption from existing taxi local rules and regulations. They go straight to the state level, so they are exempt from city level regulations. Once they win that deregulation, they're able to flood the streets with vehicles in order to outcompete the existing taxi industry. And explain what those regulations they no longer have to abide by are. So the regulations would be around, for example, vehicle requirements, you know, the number of inspections a vehicle has to go through, um, the amount of mileage that a vehicle can have, as well as insurance requirements in cases of accidents, um, as well as, you know, criminal background checks on drivers and the licensing process, and, of course, any kind of a permit, like in New York City, you know, it's famous for the medicine the number you see on top of the yellow cab, which it, it's its own capital, and at one point here, cost close to a million dollars for the corporate medallion. Uber and Lyft enter into these cities with none of these expenses. And so it's not a, it's obviously not a level playing field. But what's also important to note is, after they're able to deregulate the taxi regulations and flood the streets with vehicles, and the way they flood them with vehicles, by the way, is they use Wall Street money to lure drivers with these high bonuses. Soon as the bonuses dry up, the drivers start to plummet into poverty. In fact, the Federal Trade Commission fined Uber $25 million for false advertising over these bonuses. Um, and, and then Uber and Lyft used their lobbying might to exempt themselves from existing labor laws. In 21 states, they've gotten an exemption that basically companies that are part of the so-called gig economy. So if the work is dispatched through an app, that these companies then, um, they would be exempt from any employer responsibilities. They could cut the rates as low as they want. Even if the drivers earn below minimum wage, there's no protection for the driver. There is no economic floor for the workers. And so professional drivers like Douglas are seeing their profession, you know, just being economically crushed, and there is no alternative for them. I wanted to go back to another excerpt of what Douglas Shifter posted on Facebook before he killed himself in front of New York City Hall on Monday. 
He said car companies had slashed their rates since the introduction of Uber and Lyft in the city. He wrote, quote, due to the huge numbers of cars available with desperate drivers trying to feed their families, they squeeze rates to below operating costs and force professionals like me out of business. They count their money, and we are driven down into the streets we drive, becoming homeless and hungry. I will not be a slave working for chump change. I would rather be dead," he wrote on Facebook, and then killed himself. You know, and I've been organizing for over 20 years in the taxi industry. We were on the verge of a historic victory just a few years ago, before Uber and Lyft ascended into town. I have never seen drivers in more deeper despair and crisis. You know, every day, um, there are more vehicles that these companies put out onto the streets. And what's important to note is that it's a revolving door. Uber itself has said that more than 50 percent of the drivers only stay with Uber for six months at a time. I mean, you know, you know, a few years ago, right, the questions would be, are unions relevant? The question of the gig economy is, are workers relevant? And imagine, you know, you're working 12 hours, barely making $50 for yourself, and the entire time you're hearing that automation is right around the corner. Because, in, up, you know, as far as these companies are concerned, you're earning $50 too many. So, of, of course, there's a sense of hopelessness, uh, particularly, you know, we know that the economy is not accidental. It's not an act of God. It's not a natural disaster. These are politically motivated decisions that give corporate America and these Wall Street companies advantages and allow them a free will to destroy livelihoods. Beta V, we're talking about Douglas Shifter, but on December 20th, hours after a hearing about the Taxi and Limousine Commission threat to take away his license, Danilo Corporan Castillo, who was 57 mm -hmm. years old, plunged from the roof of his Harlem—of uh, a, of a Harlem building after calling his wife in distress after the mounting fines he owed. Douglas Shifter is just the latest suicide. That's right. This is the third—Douglas was the third suicide we know of in within these t just two to three months. And there is a crisis. There is, there is a human crisis. A as a result of the political failures, you know, that have given these Wall Street companies a free hand. Um, and, you know, most of their lobbyists, by the way, come out of the Democratic Party. Many of them went straight from the Obama White House to work for Uber, you know. and. Um, It's and not... talk about the role. In this case, we're talking mm -hmm. about New York, but this mm -hmm. is happening around the country. Um, Shifter specifically talked about um, Bloomberg, mm -hmm. whose family he said he had driven around, his mm -hmm. mother and daughter. Mm -hmm. He talked about current Mayor de Blasio, and he talked about Governor Cuomo. Yes, I mean, Governor Cuomo has really been Uber's biggest cheerleader in the state of New York. You know, Douglas's main post talked about the, the saturation of vehicles. There's not enough fares, there's too many cars, nobody can earn a living. It's a race to the bottom. Finally, Cornell West, a famed black activist, spoke at Yale, ushering in Black History Month. Here's part of what he had to say. The pull the veil over all of the corruption, and you begin to look like the Roman Empire, military overreach, corruption among your elites, financial, political, and culture, and then a fundamental culture of mass distraction, weapons of mass distraction. Just make sure that the citizenry feels so helpless and so hopeless and so powerless that they can't wait to see the Super Bowl on the weekend, even as they catch in hell after the game is over. That's what brings down most empires. That machismo identity and hubris and arrogance of power and think that you can just do anything you want to deploy your arbitrary power and the victims will never, ever be able to render you accountable. And one of the reasons, again, why black history is at the center of the history of this nation. And as I said before, if black folk had given up on truth, goodness, and beauty, 
and love of neighbor. Some of us are Christians, so we try to love our enemies too. We need a whole lot of grace for that. But if black folk had just dished out counter terrorists, it had been a civil war every generation in America. There would be no American democracy. America would be fascist across the board because there would be terror cells across the nation. That's the black ISIS option that we refused. We refused it. I tell my white brothers and sisters, when you see black people, just give them a standing ovation. <laughs> That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.